Good evening. Welcome to Fermi Lab. Wrong, wrong guy. Wrong guy. Wrong guy. Hang in there. It's coming. Uh, I'm Tom Carter, the host this evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to Fermi Lab. Tell you some upcoming events. Our Christmas show is December 3rd. The Irish Dancing and Musical Ensemble Danu will be here. It's going to be a great show. Uh, and then January. I don't know if you know. 50 years of Fermi Lab. So the first talk for the lecture series um, is going to be Chris Quigg uh, on January 27th. It's going to be Fermi Lab's greatest hits, highlights from the first 50 years. So you want to see that. And so now, what you've been waiting for, direct from the speech department at the College of DuPage, the MC for tonight's show, Chris Miller. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Chris Miller. I am a professor of speech communication at College of DuPage. But for the next hour and 15 minutes or so, I will be your MC for the 2016 Fermilab Physics Slam, which is, uh, yeah, you can applaud that. It's a pretty good thing. <clears throat> you know, it's our fifth time doing the Physics Slam. And it's interesting. I was all week long. I don't even know how to make this happen for you. All week long, I have been thinking about the physics slam, right? That I get the opportunity to do it again for the fifth time. I was, you know, I was thinking that five years ago, Tom Carter just approached me in the hallways at COD and said, would I be willing to MC the physics slam? Which as a speech person, right, didn't make a lot of sense to me, right? Like, yeah, I'll go in there and I'll talk about physics and, or I won't. I'll learn, what am I gonna do, Tom? And he just said, just go up there and introduce people. And that's what I did. <clears throat> and uh, that was five years ago, I went to a meeting and I wasn't sure it was gonna work out. But then, last year and this year, the Physics Slam is the fastest and first sold out show of the entire year here at Fermilab. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, we, we sell out faster than Tom Skilling. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, Tom Skilling, get that on camera. Um, but anyway, so we're here, right? We're doing the physics slam for the for the fifth year, and uh, it's a pleasure. And you know, here's the thing: it's also it's 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 my pleasure to be here to to do this because um, I remember the first year when I when I was going to do it, I, I thought I'd come out and just tell a couple you know tell a couple jokes and be that kind of MC. And then as I stood back there, as I always do, and I looked out front, and or I looked out here, and I saw how many. Um, kids and young adults were here. And it kind of made me, well, it almost made me cry. My son is actually, Wyatt Miller's down here in the front row, and he's, uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> and it's his first time. It's his first time in Physics Slam, and tomorrow's his ninth birthday. But it was great because at the time, yeah, maybe we'll sing happy birthday to him later or something. But, but the thing is, <clears throat> is that when I first, I thought, you know, like, here I am, I have, I have a son, and he was, at the time, my only, my only child, and, and I thought, <clears throat> Like, let me, look, before I go into this, if you're under the age, if you're 18 or under, do me a favor right now, applaud, yell, scream, do something. Ready, and go. <laughs> I mean, look, here's the thing. Think about this. Today, Wyatt's last day at, at Hammerschmidt Elementary in Lombard, today's their last day. They go into Thanksgiving break next week. And a lot of you might have that same schedule. So here you are on your very first night of Thanksgiving break, at a physics slam. <laughs> yeah, you can absolutely applaud that. You know, it makes me, and that's why I don't want to tell jokes, because it makes me just happy that I know that no matter what happens in our world, no matter what happens nationally, anything, there is a core of young people that are willing to go to a physics slam on a Friday night rather than sit at home and play video games or go watch some pop star or go do something that we normally think young people do. I am so grateful that I'm here to talk with and be a part of young people learning about science. It, it feels, as an educator, it fills my heart to watch that. I love doing this. And I'm just honored again to watch these five speakers <laughs> I'm going to be sitting right there watching everything again because I love watching their speeches. They're amazing. So let's talk then about what's going to happen tonight. Each speaker is going to come out here 
one at a time, right? Well, yeah, they're all gonna come out at once and they're gonna speak. They're gonna come out, <laughs> they're gonna come out one at a time. And they get 10 minutes to speak, 10 minutes about their subject, their topic, their interests, their research, something. They, but here's the thing about the 10 minutes. It's a hard 10 minutes. We keep them to 10. We came out last week, if they're at 12, we're like, look, you gotta cut two minutes. Dave, Dave Dykstra here in the front row and I, we're always like, you gotta cut two. Because here's the thing, if they go to 10 minutes, right, there's a timer here in the front. You are going to hear this sound. <laughs> Thank you, iPad. <clears throat> and what's gonna happen is, that it doesn't disqualify them, right? But they know they went past 10 minutes. It doesn't ultimately matter because the winner is decided by you, not by us, but by you. When we are finished with all of this, I will bring out each speaker individually, and then we will, I will ask you to applaud, yell, scream, stomp your feet, whatever you want to do, and we are going to record how loud that is. And whichever one of the speakers gets the loudest applause, they win. And they win prizes, uh, I, I understand there's, uh, I was having dinner with uh, Chris, Mo Chris Mossy tonight, he said they're going to go on some lavish vacation, he's going to fly him. Complete surprise to him, I think, more than anybody else. <laughs> Sorry Chris, <laughs> you're committed. Um, but that's how they win, right, and that's it. And it's really just for you. It's about education, it's about telling you about physics and them being excited to tell you about their research and us appreciating what they get to do, okay? Um, and then when we're finished with all that, uh, I'll bring them all out once we award and we will open up the questions to you. So if you have questions for any of the speakers, you can feel free to do that. Um, if you want to ask, no one's ever asked me a question. You can, it's fine. I have things to talk about. And in fact, tonight, I did wear my Albert Einstein socks. <clears throat> right, yes, I wore it. <clears throat> Interesting fact, Albert Einstein, March 14th. Christopher James Miller, March 14th. So, there's a couple of geniuses here standing right in front of you. You are welcome. <laughs> okay. Anyway, let's get started. Uh, are you ready to get started to watch these speakers? I hope that you actually are. Good. Me too. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our very first speaker of the night. Put your hands together for Robin Bjorkquist. Five years ago, in the spring, I was at home on my couch, thinking about how I would need to sell the couch soon, because I was about to move 3,000 miles away to go to graduate school, to become a physicist. For me, this was a time of tremendous hope, <laughs> but also uncertainty, because my life was on the brink of change, and I didn't know where this adventure would take me. Suddenly, I got an email. It said, Robin, how would you like to come to grad school early to start research on the muon G-2 experiment? I thought, huh? The muon G what? I have no idea what that is. So naturally, I replied, yes. <laughs> when can I start? So I sold the couch, said goodbye to my family and friends, and moved to Cornell University. You know, I think I imagined that grad school would transform me, that I would come in as an ordinary person and emerge a scientist. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't feel any different. But I have learned a few things. For instance, I did eventually learn what the muon G-2 experiment is. The very first thing I did was read the experiment proposal and the first 12 words tell you the answer. We propose to measure the muon anomalous magnetic moment to 0.14 parts per million. Now, <laughs> it's one thing to read those words and a different thing entirely to know what they say. I can translate. This says, we, with our awesome science resources, are going to measure one property of one type of elementary particle and we are going to do it better than anyone has ever done it before. See, the trick with things like this, well, you have to learn the jargon. There's no way around that. But then you just break it down like a word problem. There are three important pieces here. First, the muon, that's the particle. Second, the anomalous magnetic moment. That's the property we're going to measure. And finally this, 
0.14 parts per million. That tells you how well we're going to do the measurement. To understand how fantastic this is, I find that it helps to use a more familiar example, like me. I, of course, am not one of the fundamental building blocks of the universe. But like the elementary particles, I have properties you could measure if I let you. <laughs> so for example, we could measure my height. I've already done this experiment. I'm 5'7". When I say that, what I really mean is that I'm somewhere between 5'6 and a half and 5'7 and a half. So the uncertainty on my measurement is about half an inch, which means the fractional uncertainty is 0.007, or seven parts per thousand. Could we measure my height more precisely? Yeah, a little bit. But the more precise the measurement, the harder it is to get it right. That's a general fact of life. OK, what about muon g minus 2? I said 0.14 parts per million. That's 0.0000014. This is an entirely different league of measurement. Could we measure my height this precisely? No. No, we couldn't. My height has no meaning on this scale, because that would be a distance 400 times smaller than the width of a human hair. The amazing thing is that muon g minus 2 does have meaning on this scale. And by measuring it, we can learn something new about fundamental science. We just have to build the right measuring tape. That's what we do. So there I was at Cornell, just beginning to learn the craft of physics research. And I have to tell you, I wasn't feeling too sure about the whole particle physics thing. I'll tell you a secret. I'm still not sure. <laughs> but that year, that spring, something happened that made me want to stick with it, at least this long. I went on a trip to Brookhaven National Lab to help take apart a massive superconducting magnet. There it is. It fills an entire room. It is a magnificent device. This is our measuring tape. It's a storage ring, a container for muons. It sits at the heart of our experiment and makes it possible for us to measure G minus 2. This magnet was at Brookhaven because they did a muon G minus 2 measurement there 15 years ago. They actually built this magnet specifically for that experiment. It took them seven years to build it. So when Fermilab decided to do the same experiment again, but better, it made a lot of sense to go to Brookhaven and take their magnet instead of starting over from scratch, which is how I ended up in that room with a wrench taking things apart. On that trip, there was one moment that really stuck with me. I was spraying penetrating oil on some massive bolts because they were rusty. And I paused and looked out across the room at all the people working and thought, this is my experiment, and these are my people. And I felt connected, not just to the people in that room, but to generations of scientists uh, in the past and in the future. It is extraordinary to be part of something so much bigger than yourself. And it drew me in. I found myself thinking, I want to be there when we put this ring back together at Fermilab. I want to be there when we turn it on. I want to be there on the day the first muons are stored in the ring. And I want to be there when we unblind our final result and all of us together suddenly learn the answer we have spent years working for. Some of that has already come to pass, and the rest is on the horizon. Here I am with the ring at Brookhaven, taking it apart. And here I am at Fermilab with the ring back together on the day we first turned it on. <laughs> from that day to this day, and from this day to now, so much has happened. Of course, there's been the whole saga of the storage ring, taking it apart at Brookhaven, 
moving it from New York to Illinois, building a brand new experiment hall here at Fermilab to house it, moving the ring inside the new building, and finally putting it all back together again. <laughs> but that's not all. You see those people standing there in the ring? That is just part of my scientific collaboration. We have about 200 people working on this experiment from institutions across the US and around the world. And all of those people are working on different aspects of the experiment to make sure that we have all the pieces in place that we will need to make this thing run. So we've had people working on making fine adjustments to the storage ring magnet, people preparing and installing vacuum chambers and other equipment, people designing, building, and testing specialized detectors and electronics, and a whole host of other things that I don't have time to tell you about. And now, we're entering the final phase of our preparations. One year from now, this experiment will start running. It's like we are all on the brink of a new chapter in this adventure, and I, for one, I'm very excited to see how it goes. And I don't know where my old couch is these days, <laughs> but I like to think that whoever owns it now has big dreams. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. All right, that was our first speaker of the evening. Our second speaker, we will welcome to the stage now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dan Hooper. Good evening. So um, today, we are going to take a journey together through our universe and all the stuff in it, all the matter and energy, all the stuff you may have heard about, some of the things you may not have heard about. Um, but to do this, we're going to need your, your help. So I want everyone to look underneath their seats. You'll find a piece of paper. I bet a lot of you found it already, right? How many of you resisted the temptation to open the piece of paper? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what I thought. All right, so I'll let you know what to do with the paper in a minute. So when you look at the night sky, what do you see mostly? Stars. Good, good. And what are stars made of? Stuff. Be more specific than stuff. We can do better. It's a physics slam. Come on. They're made of atoms, gases of atoms, OK? So if the first entry on your paper now, the, where it says one, if the next thing, ne thing next to the one says atoms, whether in stars or in gas, I want you to stand up now and stay standing. All right, so there are about 850 of us in this room right now, and the fraction of people standing represents the fraction of the energy in the universe that's in the form of atoms. Not very many, right? It turns out that most of the energy in our universe is not made of atoms. A bigger piece is in something that we call dark matter. Stand up now, and stay standing if you're already standing, but stand up if this first entry in your paper says dark matter. All right, a lot more, right? So we don't know exactly what dark matter is. We can tell it's there from the influence of its gravity. We see it in galaxies and clusters of galaxies. We see it in the early universe. We see it everywhere we look, but we don't know what exactly it is. But still, only about a third of you are standing. So now stand up if your first entry says dark energy. That's just about everyone else, right? Not quite, but just about, OK? So we don't, again, dark energy, we really don't understand very well. It seems to be everywhere throughout space, and it seems to be making our universe expand faster and faster as time goes on. OK, now everyone sit down. Mm -hmm. 
This is our universe as we understand it today. 69 or so percent is dark energy, 26% or so is dark matter, about 5% is in atoms, and then there's a smattering of other stuff. If your first entry says photons or light, stand up. There should be one or two, where are they? There, I, I see a couple. Now neutrinos, if your first entry says neutrinos. All right, and now the best of all, do we have a black hole out there? All right. All right, so, so um, that's what our universe is like today. But what was it like in the distant past, and what will it be like in the distant future? Let's answer those questions. We're going to do the experiment again. Oh, I forgot. I have an animation. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I'm going forward in time now. I didn't mean to do that just yet, but we're going to do that. All right. This is what the universe is like 10 billion years from now. Okay. So we're going to skip the second entry because I gave you the punchline, but that's good because I'm falling way behind schedule. 10 billion years from now, most of 94% of the energy in the universe is going to be dark energy. It's going to dominate over everything else more and more as time goes on. And much smaller fractions of everything in the universe will be made of things like dark matter or atoms. Those sorts of things will get less and less important as time goes on. If we go even farther into the future, maybe to 100 billion years, more than 99.9% .9 of all the energy in the universe will be in the form of dark energy. Atoms and other kinds of matter, almost entirely irrelevant. So now let's move backwards. So to a point about 10 billion years in the past, or about 3.8 billion years after the Big Bang. If your third entry on your sheet, so we're skipping the second one, the third entry on your sheet says atoms, either in the form of stars or gas, stand up. OK, this is more than atoms were at the present date, and a lot more than they'll be in the future, but still a pretty small fraction. Now stand up if your third entry says dark matter. Wow. Dark matter is killing it 10 billion years ago, right? <laughs> All right. Most, most of the energy in our universe uh, 10 billion years ago is in the form of dark matter. And now if it said dark energy, your third entry says dark energy, stand up. All right. Cool. Have a seat. Everyone sit down. All right. So we're going to use my animation trick again. So here we go backwards in time. Dark energy gets smaller and smaller compared to the combination of dark matter in atoms, gas, and stars. Okay, but it's still kind of a, a healthy mixture there. If we go back even further, let's, let's go all the way back. Okay? Let's go to a point about, say, 10 years after the Big Bang. So these are in the very first. These are the adolescence years of our, our universe. And our universe is pretty old. To, to consider this, let's uh, say stand up if uh, your fourth entry says atoms. Yeah, no one's standing up. You know why? Because atoms can't exist under the heat of the Big Bang. If I dropped an atom into the universe 10 years after the Big Bang, it would melt. All of its electrons would fall off. So now stand up if your first entry, or your, sorry, your, your fourth entry says nuclei. Okay, we got one here. There's one, not many, but a couple. Wow. And it's your birthday tomorrow, right? Yeah. So this is your birthday present. You're going to be a nuclei, a nucleus. <laughs> all right. So, so nuclei could stay intact. They'd lose all their electrons. There are no atoms, but there could be nuclei. Now stand up if uh, your fourth entry says dark matter. OK, only, only you? Did I do this wrong? Fourth entry says dark matter? OK. Now stand up if your fourth entry says dark energy. No one stood up because dark energy wasn't even relevant yet. Now stand up if your fourth entry says light or photons. Huge. And now if it, your fourth entry says neutrinos. All right. As we go back farther and farther in time, what we see is that the dark matter slowly takes over and then is overcome by a combination of neutrinos and light. So neutrinos are the, you can all sit down. 
So neutrinos are, are very fast moving in light particles. They're very hard to detect, but it turns out they're really, really abundant in the universe. Also, background light, what I mean by that is this was the light that just filled every little corner of the universe in, 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 the, in, the, in the first years, in the first hundreds of thousands of years. This stuff dominated every corner of the universe 10 years after the Big Bang. So, okay, we have one stop left on our cosmic time travel expedition. This time, let's go back as far as we possibly can. We're going to go back to a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. At a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, we can't make any observations. We don't, can't really see that part of the universe at time. So we have to instead rely on particle accelerators to recreate the conditions of, of that part of the, our universe's history. These are a few pictures of, of uh, the Large Hadron Collider, which some of you may have heard of, or the LHC for short. We use this machine to smash protons together at the sort of speeds and with the sort of, of energies that were commonplace a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. So by looking at these collisions, we learn how matter and energy behaved at this extremely early primordial. OK, so now look at the fifth entry in your sheet. If it says either neutrinos or light, stand up. All right, so neutrinos and, and light had been totally dominant 10 years um, before, uh, after the Big Bang, but they're not that important a trillionth of a second before the, uh, after the Big Bang. OK, now you say, everyone stay standing. But now um, also stand if your sheet says electrons, muons, and taus. OK, some more. Electrons you know about. Muons and taus, well, we just heard about muons, right? But muons and taus are a lot like electrons, but they're heavier and unstable. Now stand if your sheet says W and Z bosons. OK, these are an exotic form of, of, of matter, not much of it in the universe today, but some in the early universe. And now, if you're lucky enough to be a Higgs boson, stand up. <laughs> All right, we, oh, a cluster of them over there. Um, they don't normally clump like that. Um, so, so Higgs bosons are the most recently discovered elementary particle. And I'm about to make this thing beep at me. I'm sorry about that. Um, they were discovered back in 2012 at the Large Hadron Collider. And now, uh, last but not least, stand up if your last entry says quarks and gluons. Quarks and gluons made up most of the energy in the universe uh, shortly after the Big Bang. They are the sorts of particles that combine to form protons and neutrons in our universe today, but they behave very differently in the early universe. OK, everyone can sit down. So we've just looked at five different eras in our universe's history, and they all had very different combinations of particles and other substances that inhabited them whether it be dark matter or dark energy or atoms or neutrinos or these really crazy particles most of you never heard of. Every era in our universe's history had different stuff that, that made it work and made it function the way it did. As we build even more powerful accelerators and as our telescopes look deeper into the past and with more precision, we're going to learn about times totally different, closer to the Big Bang, farther in the future. I don't know what we're going to discover, but I, for one, can't wait to find out. And thanks. For, uh, for helping me with this great experiment. Thanks, Dan. I was backstage and I heard our youngest audience member of all time. That's fantastic. Keep it up. Go science. <laughs> all right, uh, our third speaker of the evening, please. Welcome to the stage, ladies and gentlemen. Shane Larson. Okay, well, uh, my job tonight is to convince all of you that black holes are way more awesomer than anything else you hear about tonight. And uh, if there's any one thing that I really want you to remember when you walk away from the room tonight is that they are indeed mysterious objects that seem like monsters drifting alone in the cosmic dark. But they are very important and very central to our understanding of modern astrophysics. So when people ask me why I like black holes, this is usually the answer I give them. I like black holes because they're simple. And that seems a little strange to us because we all think about black holes and we learn about black holes in the context of Einstein and physics that were taught is difficult to understand. And so I like to explain this by thinking about something that is really complicated. 
Let's imagine you wanted to build a car. Okay, so the Yugo is probably the most awesome car in the universe. And if you wanted to build a Yugo, okay, you would have to describe every single thing in the Yugo, from the vinyl bucket seats to the eight track player. <laughs> what it's made of, how big it is, what it's connected to. And all told, in order to build a Yugo, you would have to describe some 20,000 individual parts. That's complicated. But a black hole, by contrast, is really simple. If I want to describe what a black hole is and what it does, I only have to give you three numbers. And those numbers are the mass, how much stuff it's made of, the spin, how fast it's rotating, and the electric charge that it carries. If I tell you those three numbers, then you can figure out everything about the properties of the, about the black hole, about what it does to the universe around it, about what its past was, and what its ultimate long-term future is. They're simple compared to things that you and I experience every single day. Now, that's all well and good, right? Physicists can tell you anything they want. I can write down some math that takes three numbers and tells you all this stuff about black holes. But I'm really an astronomer, and astronomers don't take everything at face value that physicists tell them. Astronomers are like, if you're going to tell me this stuff exists, I have to go out, I have to figure out how they're made, and I have to actually observe them. Okay, so let's start with that. How do you figure out how black holes are made? Right? These aren't things that you can go down to Radio Shack and buy some parts and build an experiment and make them, like they do here at Fermilab. <laughs> you got to look to nature to find these things. And so when we look into the sky, oops, I'm behind on my, my charts here, okay? When we look in the sky, we see vast stellar remnants. This is called a supernova remnant. This is a particularly famous one called the Cygnus Loop. You can see it from the northern hemisphere in the constellation of Cygnus in the summertime. It's what we call a supernova remnant. It's the kind of thing that forms when you make a black hole. And the way you make a black hole is you explode a star. You have to take a star and destroy it in order to make a black hole. What happens when you do that? Well, when you explode a star and you uh, 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 destroy it, it throws all of this gas and dust out into the uh, universe, which you can see. You can see it in your own backyard with a telescope if you have one. Okay? <laughs> but then there's something left behind, the stellar skeleton of what used to be there. And sometimes those stellar skeletons um, are compressed uh, objects that have very strong gravity. So here's the city of Chicago, and when I blow up a star, a common type of stellar remnant that you make is something called a neutron star. It takes something the mass of the sun, and it shrinks it down to about the size of the city of Chicago. This object has enormous gravity. If you could take a sugar cube-sized piece of it and weigh it, hold it right here in your hand, it would have the mass of the entire human race. If you were standing on the surface of the neutron star and you fell down an enormous cliff just one millimeter tall, by the time you reached the bottom of that cliff, you would be traveling 30,000 miles per hour. The gravity is enormous, but this still isn't what we call a black hole. A black hole is created when you take something the size of a neutron star and you shrink it down to the size of a few city blocks. This object's gravity is so strong that nothing, not even light, can get away from it. So, I'm an astronomer, I've seen the places they're born, but I want to see one of these, okay? So, my wife is an astrophysicist. And uh, I told her I was going to give this talk. She, she and my daughter are sitting here in the front row. And I said, Michelle, I need a picture to show people of what we look for when we look for black holes. And she's like, great, I can help you as long as you give me an image credit. Okay? So I said, okay.
Never marry someone who's a bigger smart aleck than you, right? So. <laughs> This is a serious picture, right? We're astronomers. We look at the universe with telescopes, and telescopes gather light. If the thing I'm looking for doesn't even emit light, what am I supposed to do? Well, these things have enormous gravity. And so what we do is we look for black holes doing stuff to other things in the universe. And this is a very common thing that we see, black holes like planets orbiting stars, can also orbit stars. And their gravity is so strong, they can pull gas off of that star, and we can see that happening in our telescopes. Black hole's gravity is so strong that if you get close to the black hole, its gravity will really mess you up. The side of you that's close to the black hole gets pulled on much more strongly than the side that's far away. And it tears you apart. We have a technical name for that. We call it spaghettification. <laughs> it's a real word. I know you're laughing, but if you look it up on Wikipedia, it's there, which is by definition makes it true, right? <laughs> OK. But this is not looking at the black holes themselves. This is looking at what black holes do to everything in the universe. And so about 100 years ago, Albert Einstein said, well, maybe we could look for the gravity of the black holes itself. Maybe black holes could bend the fabric of space and time, and I could look for that. Okay? He spent the next 50 years of his life, as did most of the physics community, being confused about that. And he thought, maybe this will work, and maybe it won't. And maybe this will work, and maybe it won't. And maybe this will work, and maybe it won't. He went back and forth over and over again, not being able to decide if this effect was real. Okay, but in the end, he decided it didn't matter because he decided even if it is real, you're never going to be able to measure it. But you know what? We don't listen to this dude. This is some old dude from the 20th century. And you and I live in the future. We have superconductors. We have supercomputers. We have gigantic lasers. We have things Einstein never knew about. And so we've taken those and we've built a great machine, an instrument that we call LIGO. That is two observatories, one in Livingston, Louisiana, one in Hanford, Washington. They are astronomical observatories. They're unlike any we've built in the past. Okay? At their heart is a gigantic Death Star laser <laughs> that we can use to measure the bending of space and time. Okay? We can still uh, show you what they what they look like built out of Lego. So these are Lego Legos. <laughs> September of last year, for the first time, 100 years after Einstein predicted it, we measured the gravity from two black holes traveling around each other, crashing into each other at half the speed of light, and making a single larger black hole. It was awesome the culmination of a 100-year effort to demonstrate that this was a way of looking at the universe. Now, this is not like looking at the universe with the Hubble Space Telescope. What you're looking at behind me is a computer simulation. This is what our data looks like. And our data is not very pretty. If I send it to the editor at the Chicago Tribune, they're like, go away, kid, you bother us. And so we struggle with how do we help people understand there's astrophysics in this. And as it turns out, data in physics is like all data in physics, and I can represent it in different ways. And in particular, your smartphone has some wiggles on it that look just like this, that when your smartphone pushes it out through your headphone jack, it gives you some Katy Perry that you listen to on your way to Fermilab. But if I stole your smartphone and replaced it with the LIGO data, you would hear a representation of the LIGO data when it pushes it out through your headphone. Do I hear that? OK, so here we go. Oh, man! <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Uh, it's made me gig. <clears throat> Sorry. OK, that was Shane Larson. Fourth speaker of this evening, please welcome to the stage, Dave Pushka.
Okay, I'll wait for the slide to load. This doesn't count against my time, does it? Okay, all right. My name's Dave, and I have a confession to make. I am not a physicist. I'm an engineer. I'm one of a handful of engineers. Thank you. Who had the lovely opportunity to work with this group of physicists to build the NOVA FAR detector. The purpose of NOVA is to measure the, uh, the differences in the neutrino masses. You can't measure the neutrino mass directly, but they're gonna measure the differences in it. All right. Um, if you wanna know about that and the mass hierarchy, I'm not your guy, I know a couple of guys. <laughs> All right, how do you build a big detector? This is a schematic of what the NOVA detectors look like. There are two of them, the FAR detector up in upstate Minnesota near Ash River, the, the NEAR detector, which is um, over there somewhere. Um, and to give you a sense of scale, how very large these detectors are, this is LeBron James, not a small human, <laughs> all right? It's a very big detector. Why do you need such a big detector? Because neutrino events are very rare. So to see them, you need a lot of neutrinos or a very big sensitive detector. You could compare it to wanting to see your favorite baseball team win the World Series. <laughs> you need a very good team or you gotta wait 108 years. This detector is our very good team. All right. A simulation of a neutrino event. How do you detect a neutrino? What happens? A neutrino hits the nucleus of an atom and charged particles come out. In the NOVA detector, those charged particles get turned into light and we can detect the light. What is the ultra sophisticated neutrino detecting material? I'm sorry to say you guys have this at home. Baby oil. What does this have? It has a bunch of atomic nuclei. What's the other thing about the baby oil that's interesting? It's transparent. So the light that's emitted gets to our detectors. Now we do some tricks to it. We, um, we turn it into scintillator by adding a little bit of color to it. I don't know if you can see this color. And this color is tuned to the sensitivity of our photo detectors. So our photo detector can see the light emitted. Now if you had a great big bathtub of let me go forward. A great big bathtub of scintillator that would not be a very good neutrino detector because the physicists need positional information. So let me suggest to you that you take a downspout from your gutter, you fill it full of scintillator, you put a photo detector on it, and when an interaction happens, this whole thing lights up and your photo detector sees it. And since you need positional data, you take a couple more and you put them side by side, and now you got horizontal position. You do the same thing vertically, and you have a vertical position, and you crisscross them. Now, when both of these tubes light up, you know exactly where the neutrino event happened, right at the crisscross. Make sense? All right, now we're a little more sophisticated at Fermilab than to use gutter downspouts from Menards. <laughs> and I hope it doesn't rain tonight, because these are from my house. <laughs> All right, so, so we made our own extrusions. We, um, we got an extruder and we had these custom extrusions made, 16 cells. Ultimately, all 16 of these will get filled with scintillator and a photo detector added to it. We'll take two of these extrusions and slap them together and make something with 32 cells. And that becomes our detector. This is a machine that can keep making extrusions. You keep pouring plastic in at one end, the extrusion keeps coming out. How long do we make it? A very technical thing went into deciding how long to make it. Let me tell you about it, the length of a truck. <laughs> Every truck on the highway can carry something about 50 feet long, so we made extrusions 50 feet long so we could close the door, all right? We decided to use Henry Ford's assembly line techniques at the University of Minnesota with uh, undergraduate and graduate students to take the extrusions, glue them together into modules. Here's what the factory looked like. They worked cheap. And we built <laughs> these modules that went up to Ash River. Now, physicist's view of this. We've got these, this block. It's 50 feet wide. That light to that light, 50 feet wide. I'd love to tell you how tall it is. This building isn't big enough. The building's only 37 feet but that gives you a sense of how large the detector is. We build the detector horizontal because everyone likes to work in the down flat. 
and then we assemble it, move it down to the end of the hall, fill it with scintillator when it's down there, and repeat that process a few times. I know what you're thinking. This isn't very complicated. Baby oil, gutter downspouts. My science fair project was better than this. <laughs> Just wait a minute, it gets better. So a block, in order for it to stand up and not fall over, has got to be sufficiently wide, right? The last thing we want to do is have a 50-pound object fall over like that. How wide does it have to be? After lots of analysis, we concluded it has to be 50, I'm sorry, it has to be seven feet wide. Turns out that's about the same aspect ratio of this book. Now, what does that mean? 50 feet wide, 50 feet tall, seven feet thick. That's a bunch of plastic that weighs 400,000 pounds, 200 tons. Now, all of a sudden, the in engineering got interesting on this, all right? I have to, look, do you guys know how much that is? A semi-truck, fully loaded, 80,000 pounds at capacity. So this block, this block is the weight of five semi-trucks, or two Southwest Airlines 737s, fully loaded with fuel, ready for takeoff, and my wife's luggage on board. <laughs> All right, we need an assembly table the size of a residential home, and we've got to take it down the hallway 250 feet, at least the first block. Here's what we came up with. This is our machine, this is our assembly table. 50 feet wide, 50 feet tall, seven foot thick block. Look at it from below. It's a little more impressive when you consider how much weight is above it. Look how high that thing is. Why do we do it that way? Hold that thought for a minute. All right, we get it down the hall, and the next thing we have to do is get it to the vertical position. This is what we came up with. That's sped up a little bit. We went a whole lot slower when we moved it vertically. All right, and, and we realized that instead of picking the block up from one end, it was easier to pivot it about a point close to the CG. So we renamed our assembly table. We called it the pivoter. This is the pivoter in action. All right, fast forward. We've run the block down the hall. We've got it almost in a vertical orientation. Here we're a little bit closer to vertical. Ultimately, we have to set it down on the floor we have one million pounds of hydraulic jack capacity to lower my 400,000 pound block and my 200,000 pound assembly table gently on the floor and somebody measuring the distance between the two of them. All right, this is what it looks like in real time a block going in. That's it, right there. We set this object down within a quarter inch, which was the specification of the block preceding it, directly lined up. That ain't too shabby. All we had to do was repeat that a few more times. This is block number 27, the last block to go in. We built 28 blocks. This is block 27, the last one to go in. The physicists start numbering with zero. I don't get it, all right? <laughs> But this is our block, we, uh, we, we, we stenciled it, we pulled the pivoter back, we did this photo op, we parked the pivoter next to it, we anchored the pivoter on the ground to act as a bookend, so as we filled the detector full of uh, scintillator, it didn't go out. It's like a big bookend, just like the bookends on your bookshelf. And my colleagues have now grown in numbers. This is the collaboration that uh, when we completed the detector in 2014, they're people from all over the world, but what's missing here are the engineers. While the collaboration is sitting here thinking about neutrino events, and these are real neutrino events, the engineers aren't here, because we're off doing something more important. I'm sorry, more interesting. <laughs> I didn't say that. We're off doing interesting things, and I should tell you about the thing I'm working on next. It is so exciting but I'm out of time. <laughs>
Okay, well, thanks, Marianne, for helping me out. Um, Marielle Petit wrote this skit, I mean, talk, and um, I've never given it before, so maybe you can give me some advice. Okay, so that's good enough. Why don't you just go through the talk, and I'll just, you know, make comments as you go along, sorry? Okay, hello. Uh, my name's Eric Previs. I'm here to talk to you about the mu to e experiment at Fermilab. Uh, okay, mu. You might want to start with that name. It, it kind of sounds like a, a cat meowing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I suppose it does. When we say... <laughs> When we say mu to e, we mean muon to electron. Uh, muons and electrons are two flavors of uh, lepton. Oh, flavor. You might want to explain what that is because, you know, I'm thinking um, ice cream. Yeah, I suppose yeah. physicists use words differently and jargon differently. Um, when yeah, we say flavors, should. we really mean uh, two types of similar things. Okay. Um, it would be really nice if I had some study aids right now. Oh. Uh, but I guess I'll have to make do without yeah. them. Uh, I think we all know about electrons. Along with protons and neutrons, they make up ordinary matter. Um, you just heard about muons from Robin. Uh, they're like electrons, but uh, 200 times heavier and unstable. Um, in our standard model, there are two flavors of what we call leptons, the lightest particles. Um, each has an associated neutrino. And as you just heard from... <laughs> As you just heard from Dave, uh, the neutrinos are very light and go through almost everything. These are what we call fundamental particles. That means, as far as we know, they're not made of anything else, and you can't pull them apart. They're like the smallest Legos. Um, you can use the Legos to make the entire set, and these fundamental particles um, okay. make up all of the universe around us. Now, ordinarily, when a muon decays... Oh, okay, decay. Another one of those words I think that kind of confuses people. It sounds like death. <laughs> I suppose it does. Um, when we say decay... All right. When we say decay... We really just mean it disappears and it's replaced by an electron and two neutrinos. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, that sounds less sad. That's well, that's funny. what ordinarily happens. But we're interested in a special case where the muon decays and is replaced by only an electron. Okay. Now, in our model, this can happen, but it's exceedingly rare. It's the chance that you're elected president, then you hit... Yeah, presidential jokes are funny. Um, and, then you hit nine, <laughs> and then you hit nine straight holes in one and then the White House is hit by a meteor. <laughs> um, basically, <laughs> this joke was written a long time ago. Um, basically, we can say it, it, it never happens. <laughs> but we know that our model is incomplete. Um, we know, for example, as Dan said, that we can't explain dark matter. Um, and as Shane just said, the gravity he talked about doesn't fit in with our model. So um, we know the model's incomplete, and a lot of the, we have models or explanations for what is, potential explanation for what lies beyond, but we need experiments to measure them. And that's where mu to e comes in, because um, if these models are true, this mu to electron conversion should happen much more often, and we'll be able to see it. So if we see it, it'll be a clue to physics beyond our standard model. And if we don't see anything, um, we'll rule out a lot of theories. So either way, it's progress. We see it. We see it. You, you might want to say something about how we see a neutrino. Oh, that's a good point, because as we heard, neutrinos go through just about everything, and we can never detect an individual neutrino. They, through, they go right through our detectors uh, it, like, they're not, like, they're, like they're not even there. They're not even there. Um, but that's what we're doing. We're trying to design an experiment so we can tell whether or not the neutrinos are there um, in spite of the fact we can't detect them directly. Uh, it turns out the best way to do that is to make the muon stand still. So our first step is to capture it. Ooh. Sounds like <laughs> jail. <laughs> well, not really. No, not jail. Um, really, when we say capture it, um, we mean capture it on an aluminum nucleus. It's a little like, um, you know, when we, the last time we did this talk, this Pokemon joke killed. Um, <laughs> and now it's completely out of date. So, um, and nobody laughed about the White House. And um, 
Uh, maybe you've got something new. Maybe something from the World Series. World Series. Uh, you say that aluminum might be better than catching than the Indians were in Game Six. Okay, I suppose so. Yeah. Two World Series jokes in one physics evening. Who would not? Uh, anyway, so yes, the aluminum gets captured. Uh, the muon gets captured on the aluminum. Now, at this point, I think we need an equation. How about that? Oh, yeah, because everyone loves equations. Right, right. But they know this one, right? Oh, OK, good start. I I'm guessing everybody knows Einstein. OK, well, E equals mc squared just says that energy and um, mass are really the same thing related by a constant. Um, uh, and that energy is conserved. So we start with the energy of the muon, or the energy represented by the mass of the muon, and uh, when, in the end, everything has to add up to that since energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Now, since the muon is so much heavier than electrons and neutrinos, uh, most of its mass goes into motion of those particles. So if a muon decays to only an electron, then that electron gets all of the energy of its mass and goes away very quickly. On the other hand, if it decays in an ordinary way to an electron and two neutrinos, then the energy is divided amongst all of them, and the, and, and the electron um, mm -hmm. goes away with, always goes away with a lower energy. So it's the electron's energy that gives us our clue whether the neutrinos are there or not, whether or not we can, we can see them. And we're building a detector to very precisely measure that electron energy to tell if it has that one special energy that lets us know there were no neutrinos. Okay, so maybe a little more detail about what a detector would look like. Okay, well here's the detector. Um, it's a little like a microscope, but it's a microscope that's the size of an NBA basketball court, and um, I could stand inside of it. Uh, the protons come in here, they make muons that travel down this magnetic channel. This is where the aluminum sits and that traps them, and then we wait for the electrons to come out here. We've designed the detector so these low energy electrons that we're not interested in go right down the middle and we don't see them. We've already started building it. Of course, we don't send in just one muon. We send in about 10 billion muons a second, so in the end we'll have a quintillion muons. Oh, you might want to explain how many that is. Well, it's a billion billion or a one followed by 18 zeros. Oh, uh, not a big improvement. Okay, how about this? Roughly the total number of grains of sand on all the beaches in the world. Oh, I guess that's as good as you can do here. Wow. Well, we have to go through that much to have any chance of seeing something this rare. And um, if we do, we'll really improve on this measurement. The previous best measurement was made in Switzerland, and they didn't see it. So they showed that it happens less than one in a trillion times. That's a one followed by 12 zeros. That's roughly the chance your house will be hit by a meteor. We like meteors here. Um, today. Uh, on the other hand, if we do this experiment right, we'll do a factor of 10,000 better, um, which means that we will see it if it happens one in 10 quadrillion times. That's a one followed by 16 zeros. That's the chance your house will be hit by a meteor in the next 10 seconds. Uh, now, it's very rare for one experiment to make such a big improvement in one step, which is why the MUTE experiment is so special. Okay, uh, so I guess at this point, you might want to say something about how this fits in with the LHC over at CERN in Geneva. So glad you asked. Um, the LHC, as you know, is much bigger, involves a lot more people, and operates at a much higher energy. However, by studying these rare decays, we are, since we are very complementary, and in fact, we can see a few things that the LHC can't. After all, sometimes great things come in small packages. You don't have to be big to be powerful. <laughs> There's so much high-fiving. <clears throat> um, okay, that's it. Those are the five speakers. Let's give them all one more round of applause. Okay, now is the, uh, I guess we're gonna select the winner is what's gonna happen. 
So as Dave is setting up the recording, audio recording device, I will ask all five speakers to come out here. And not yet though, hold. And <laughs> they're like this. Um, but so then we're, and I'll go one at a time, I'll introduce them, and then we're gonna give them, I think five seconds. So five seconds to cheer as loud as you can. You'll see the timer, it'll be up there, and then we'll cut it down, and it'll give us an idea of, 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 of who's the winner, right? If we have a tie, well then, it's two vacation packages we have to hand out, but if it's, uh, but hopefully it won't be that. So here we go. This is the the this is what we're what is this called, Dave? Is it, okay, a sound meter, he says. <laughs> the applause meter. Let's try it out. We'll try it one time. Uh, since it's my son's birthday tomorrow, we're just gonna I'm gonna say uh, let's give it up for Wyatt Miller and let's applaud for five seconds and we'll see how it allows. Ready? So here we go. That gives us our max number, I think. Or are we peaking it? Is it peak? Are we, are we going by the, going by the max number first? The, the pie is the peak. Okay. That's the technical, <laughs> what's what we're doing technically. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, Wyatt wins. He wins with the 95. Okay, so all five speakers, please come out, ladies and gentlemen, one more time. Okay, oh, step forward. We'll just go in the same order that we spoke. So, let's start off first. Applause, five seconds. I will just cut you off and we'll go with the max. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, Robin Bjorkquist. All right, got our numbers written down. Excellent. Speaker two, Dan Hooper. Terrific. Our third speaker of the evening, Shane Larson. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> we'll try it. Let's just let's try it again. We'll try it again. No, yes? Okay. The third speaker, Shane Larson. It's better than the 88.5, I thought it was that. <laughs> Terrific work. Our fourth speaker of the evening, Dave Pushka. <laughs> Terrific. And our fifth and final speaker of the evening, Eric Prebus and his helpers. Okay, those are the five we've got. We're gonna do our technical, uh, we'll do, <laughs> we're gonna tabulate the results. Check them all out for a couple minutes. I do want to, before we, as we are getting the numbers kind of squared away to just decide who's first, second, third, and fourth, and fifth, well, we're not going to do all five. I would be five. Um, but here's the thing. I do want to, you know, one thing before I came out today, I do want to, there are two dozen, I know I had mentioned that there's a lot of younger people here tonight. There are two dozen students from the Illinois Math and Science Academy that are here tonight. Where are you at? Yeah, stand up real quick. Stand up. Stand up real quick. It's great to see you. You know, I was thinking, I, I thought of you because there's all these, you know, younger people back there as they were doing the last skit. And every time they came through, they all put their hands together and did like a silent whoop, whoop. I don't even know what they were doing back there. <laughs> it was great. You should have seen it. So I just, I just, I cannot thank enough the enthusiasm that we receive from the younger people, from everybody that's out to come out to, 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 Fermi, to, 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 to Fermi Lab to celebrate and, 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 I don't know, participate in this incredible event that we do every single year. So, it looks like we do have our winners, okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Chris Mossy, who is going to be handing out our awards tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, to the stage, Chris Mossy. Good evening. 
Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm a Deputy Director here at uh, Fermilab, and on behalf of Nigel Lockyer, our director, who couldn't be here tonight, welcome again to uh, the fifth annual Physics Slam. I want to hand out the prizes here in just a second, but before I do that, Chris, I want to thank you uh, five years in a row. Thank you for doing this. Happy birthday, Wyatt. <laughs> Uh, I've, got, uh, I've got some news. Uh, I've got uh, five certificates here, uh, and the grand prize is not a trip to the Bahamas. Ah, it's I'm even sorry. better. It's <laughs> oh, even better. It's okay. an extra large Fermi sweatshirt. <laughs> Highly coveted. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be useful right away tonight, too, I guarantee you. So let me, uh, let me present uh, the prizes. Uh, first of all, uh, Robin, congratulations. Thank you for, these are the, these are the prizes. Everyone wins a prize. <laughs> you have a surprise look on your face, Robin. <laughs> Dan, thank you very much. Sure. Dave, thank you. <laughs> sure. Handing out prizes in public without your eyeglasses is a high-risk event. <laughs> Eric, congratulations. Thank Shane. Thank you. There's more. <laughs> Excellent, they're all winners and we all know that. So here's the thing, um, here's, now we're gonna open up the question and answers to the floor for a little while. So, uh, you know, 10 minutes or so, I'll keep track of time. All the five of the speakers up here, this is what they're, honestly, this is what they're most excited about is we worked over the past, we worked as I watched them, the questions that they all had, you know, <laughs> as we put these things together, as I detailed the you know, craft there. But here's the thing, that they, uh, they, were, they were all really most excited about, does anyone get to ask us questions? And I was like, of course. That's what they're most excited about doing, is talking about the things that they're interested in and, and answering questions from you. So, uh, there are people with microphones, uh, microphone people, do you, are you around here somewhere? Got one down here. And I've got one over here as well. So, uh, if you wanna raise your hand, if you have a question for the speakers, just uh, we'll come to you. Direct your question to the speaker that's here, and uh, and we'll and we'll we'll go for a couple minutes here. Oh, one second. There we go. I was my question's about the black holes. Is there any byproduct of all the material going in? What's coming out? Anything? So, so uh, so this is this is the thing about black holes. You can't get out of black hole unless you can travel faster than the speed of light. So if you go in you're not coming out and nothing that we know of is going to come out either. So, you know, the first slide I showed you was we observe black holes with telescopes because we're watching stuff as it falls into the black hole. And so what happens to like gas or, you know, uh, dust that falls into the black hole is it starts traveling very fast and it gets very hot and it emits x-rays. And so that's typically the way we identify black holes now. But once you're inside, that's it. It's over with. We think. <laughs> question over there? Uh, I've got a question for the MC. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. No, I got this. What do you need? How's your day been? It's been good, thanks. Good to know. Yeah. Thank you. That's all I got? Son of a... <laughs> Oh gosh, I'm sorry. I'm sort of thinking about myself. Like, what kind of question you might may ask? Where's my microphone over here? Okay. Go ahead, sir. I'm sorry, I lost myself. Um, I have a question for about the uh, dark. I have a question about the dark energy. Um, is modified Newtonian dynamics an acceptable way of describing the behavior that is also explained by dark energy and dark matter? Sure. So, back in 1983 or so. This, this uh, guy, scientist, uh, Mil uh, Milgram, had this idea that maybe there isn't any dark matter and we just got it all wrong and just gravity doesn't work the way we think it does. He took the first equation you learn in high school physics, F equals MA. Who, who knows F equals MA? All right, there you go. 
right? He said, no, 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 that's not right. It's sort of true, but if you go to really small accelerations, real small values of A, it goes like F equals MA squared, okay? And if you, if you make that change, then a lot of things that dark matter do, well, you don't need dark matter to do them anymore. It just kind of fixes that. And it was a good idea back then, but since then we've measured a whole lot of things and they keep looking like dark matter and they don't look like MOND, modified Newtonian dynamics. These days, very few scientists think that MOND is really the way to explain all these observations. Dark matter seems to be pretty on pretty solid footing at this point. Excellent. Uh, back here, oh, young man. Um, well, what originally got you into physics? <laughs> oh, Robin. <laughs> I think it was an accident. <laughs> I uh, went to college and had to decide what to major in, and I liked my physics class best. Here I am. <laughs> right over here. Um, I always liked physics. When I, when I was a kid, I, I, I had an Etch-a-Sketch, and I would, I would go back and forth until I scraped off all the silver and I, I could see what was inside. So I think that's when I started to <laughs> like physics. Um, in college, I had no idea what I wanted to do, uh, but one day I was fired from a gas station and, um, and the physics department was hiring. So I got a job in the... Uh, true story, true story. I'd never heard of particle physics, um, but uh, uh, there was a Chinese, there was a professor that was hiring. Um, I went into his office. Um, he told me later that I didn't seem very bright, but he was Chinese and he didn't like interviewing people in English, so he just hired the first guy that came through the door. Um, uh, I never gave the filling station their shirt back either. <laughs> yeah, as a person that uh, works in, in higher ed, uh, parents who are maybe with your kids and you're thinking, you know, what, what are you going to major in? This happens all the time, right? <laughs> I mean, we just stumble upon stuff. I mean, it's, it's very, very common. So it, just go have fun when you're there, right? You'll figure it out as you get closer and closer. Over here, young man. So what was the name of the subparticle discovered in 2015? The Higgs? Yeah. I think you mean the Higgs boson, and it was discovered in 2012. You're real close. So the Higgs boson is one of the coolest particles we've ever discovered. All right, it's the last missing piece. It's not missing anymore, but until then it was the missing piece of what we call the standard model of particle physics. It kind of holds everything together, makes everything else make sense. If there were, if there were no Higgs bosons, all or most of the particles in nature, the fundamental ones anyway, wouldn't have any mass. That means things like quarks and electrons and W and Z bosons, those weird things I mentioned before. None of these things would have any mass. They'd all travel at the speed of light all the time. That means there would be no atoms, there'd be no planets, no stars, no life. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty important. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, back here. There you go. Please. Hi. Um, how slash why did the composition right here in the center, for right, those right of you looking? Center. We're all blind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, how slash why did the composition of the universe change? Was it simply due to a change in temperature, or were there other forces involved? Good question. So if I had 12 minutes instead of 10, that's where I would have gone with it. So thanks. Um, so here's the thing about the expansion of space. When space gets bigger, the density of matter goes down. You just dilute it, right? It's the same amount of stuff in more space, so all the densities of matter go down. But dark energy isn't like this. You can't dilute dark energy. A cubic meter of dark energy today a cubic meter of space has the same amount of dark energy in it as a cubic meter a billion years from now has in it. So that means as we wait longer and longer and longer, all the matter gets diluted away and dark energy doesn't and dark energy wins. So that's why 100 billion years from now will be all dark energy. Now going back further, it got weird as well. And that's because all of this stuff that we call radiation was really important. And when we say radiation, all we really mean are things moving close to the speed of light. Things like neutrinos and, and light itself, stuff like that. And it turns out that stuff gets diluted even faster than ordinary matter. It's a normal dilution from the space expanding, but also those waves of light in neutrinos, they get stretched and they lose energy from the stretching of space. 
So that takes a universe that starts out with all these radiation particles, light and neutrinos. Those go away, and the matter takes over, the atoms and dark matter. And then the dark energy takes over, and it wins in the end. I hope that one-minute answer uh, (laughs) prevailed your curiosity. (laughs) Perfect. I guess I only needed 11 minutes. (laughs) There in the back. So I have another question about dark energy. So if uh, the like a cubic meter of space today is the same amount of dark energy as a cubic meter in the past, and if space is expanding, wouldn't that violate conservation of energy if like, there's more dark energy now? Yeah, so it turns out all of your science teachers lied to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> energy is not really conserved, okay? What, what, the, but, okay, they didn't really lie. All right. What they said, if, if, if you read the legalese, what they say is that in any closed system, okay, an, an interaction between particles conserves energy. Okay? And that's all true. But there's nothing about a cubic meter that's a closed system. Okay? So energy is not going from one place to another place. It's not being transferred from between different things. So in this sort of uh, situation, the kind of situation we talk about with expanding space, there really isn't a, a law of conservation energy that we can rely on. I'm looking in this general direction, but I have no idea who I'm talking to. Way in the back. All right, way up there. Right there. Yeah, no. Sorry to break your heart about the law of conservation of energy. <laughs> Where did you get the baby oil? Uh, that baby oil was in my office. That, that sample was in my office. Um, the big baby oil came from a refinery in Louisiana and was shipped by tanker um, to Chicago where we added the little bit of pseudocumene. Um, in scintillator, you add 5% pseudocumene to it that's a primary scintillant. You add a couple of more uh, chemicals in less than 1% quantities that shift the light emitted by the pseudocumene to something that the um, photo detector is, is good at seeing. Um, that was mixed outside, oh, I guess that way, um, in, in the city. And then it went by tanker straight to Ash River, and I should know how many uh, tanker trucks. It was on the order of about 300 tanker trucks. Um, if, if you buy mineral oil in that quantity, it's about $4 a, a gallon. Um, and we did this project at the time when the price of oil was going up and up and up, and so we were highly scrutinized about the money in our budget to pay for the oil. What if it got to $5 a gallon? All right. Uh, we're back here, uh, right there in the red. And- um, so conceptually, I don't exactly understand. Now, this none of you mentioned this in your presence. Any, any of them, <laughs> any, yeah. Uh, so conceptually, I don't understand why the two components of light, electricity and magnetism, move perpendicular to each other. Why, why is that so? <laughs> I got it. Who's good at that? <laughs> How good are you guys at your Jackson problems? Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> all right. So there are lots of layers to this question. There are whole classes taught that for each of the layers. But uh, <laughs> sounds really simple, but it's not. So okay, the theory of electromagnetism, at some levels, is a really simple theory. It's a really simple symmetry. We call a U1 symmetry. It's the simplest kind of all, all mathematical symmetries. And that dictates everything about electromagnetism. Okay. Um, it says that the photon, the particle that carries the electromagnetic force, has to be exactly massless. It tells you what it couples to and how those things interact. And it tells you everything. You can derive all the equation of electromagnetism magnetism from that principle alone if you take about six quarters of quantum field theory. Um, from that set of mathematics, you can derive a set of equations called Maxwell's equations. Okay. So Maxwell's equations were discovered long before the stuff I'm talking about now. Okay. So they're kind of rever- re- discovered in reverse order. But from Maxwell's equations, it just works out that the, 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 if you work out what an electromagnetic wave looks like, what, a, what it looks like when electromagnetic energy passes through space, there's an electric field that's moving in one direction. It waves up and down. Okay. And every time you have one of these waves, there has to be accompanying that electric field, a magnetic field, and it goes, like, uh, like the question said, in a perpendicular direction. So electric field, magnetic field, and then they, they move through space together. 
okay? Um, this falls out of the fundamental sym symmetries of this U1 symmetry that dictates electromagnetism. I know it's not a really satisfactory answer. I basically just said, magic, magic, magic. <laughs> lots and lots of math, magic. <laughs> but, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Let's take two more questions. We'll take two more questions right over here. What do you think the biggest discoveries will be in the next 50 years? Oh, good question. <laughs> biggest discoveries in the next 50 years. Ooh. Black holes are big. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I actually think of the, of the things that, that have a really good, ch well, a, f a fairly good chance of seeing something. The experiment I talked about has, it, it has a big window um, to discover something new. In other words, if it sees any signal, um, you know, some, some experiments work by making a very precise measurement and then comparing it to a very um, complicated calculation. Whereas this experiment, in our standard model, it shouldn't see anything. Um, so if we see anything, that'll be um, uh, absolute proof that there's physics beyond the standard model. We won't really know what it is, but it would be a very exciting result. They would take a lot more experience to know what it is, but we'll absolutely know it's there. Um, I think that would be very exciting. I think the other thing people might agree on is if uh, people really found out a direct detection of dark matter, and maybe somebody else would like to comment on that. So, so I'm an astronomer. I'm not a particle physicist. Um, so dark matter, maybe, but, um, but I would say in astronomy, the, probably the most important thing that will happen, which has already started happening in your lifetime, is we've started discovering planets around other stars. And when I was your age, we didn't know of any planets except the ones in the solar system, including Pluto. But in just the last 10 years, we've started finding planets around other stars. And right now, the thing that we would love to find the most is a planet that, in our telescopes, looks like Earth. It has water. It has clouds. It has gravity about as strong as the gravity you have here on Earth. And if astronomers found that, I think they would think that as being one of the most important things they've found in the last century. So. I need to take a shot at this. With uh, all respect to my fellow slammers, they're totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> all right. History has shown over and over again that we cannot predict what the greatest new discovery will be in, the, say, a 50-year time scale. Because what we're going to discover is way cooler than anything we can imagine now. All right. It's totally different. It's nothing we've ever thought about. It's nothing that anyone in the world's ever thought about. And it's going to blow our minds. It's going to be totally unexpected. And it's going to re revolutionize everything. I don't know what it will be. But if you just look at history, look at, take any chunk of, 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 of 50 years since the beginning of you know, the, the age of reason and you know, the invention of science, basically. Every 50-year block has a total revolution and paradigm shift, and no one saw it coming. That's going to happen again. It's going to happen again and again and again and again. Thanks for me up One more question back there. This is a question about black holes. Uh, what could stop a black hole from bending space and time? Yeah, so, so black holes bend space and time depending on how massive they are. Right? So we said there were three numbers, right? How fast they spin, how much mass, how much electric charge. So the more massive they are, the stronger their ability to bend space and time. Except the smaller the black hole is, the stronger it bends space and time really, really close to the black hole. So there's this kind of weird paradigm that you have where you think of gravity being really strong when there's a lot of mass, a lot of, a lot of source of gravity to it. But if the black hole were really tiny and you could get really close to it, it would bend space-time so enormously that it would look unlike anything you had ever seen. And so one of the things we struggle with a lot is trying to understand what are the biggest black holes that we would see and could we tell they're black holes because they bend space and time but not as strongly as tiny black holes. And when I see a tiny black hole, can I actually measure that it bends space and time at as we mathematically predict it will. So, so we don't 
know way that you can stop it from bending space and time, but we worry a lot about how much do they bend space and time and how can we tell? Because this is one of the great mysteries, is how do they bend space and time? And what does it tell us about what's deep inside in this region where you can never get out of if you fall inside? So, Awesome. <clears throat> and please just, uh, my son wants to ask one question. It's his birthday tomorrow. I'm going to give it to him. So <laughs> he's been throwing his hand up, and I'm like, just maybe. We'll see. Um, ask your dad a question. <laughs> no, don't ask me a question. I can ask him a question later. <laughs> <laughs> question. Um, this is for the magnet. Um, what made you come back to the couch in the end? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> That was a stylistic suggestion from our That's fabulous right. MC. <laughs> you planted that question, Chris. Oh, that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, that was a pleasure to be a part of this tonight. I think our speakers will be uh, going up. They'll be back up. I think they're going to be up, up top there. Um, for, I mean, there might be treats. I'm not exactly sure how that works up there. But if you want to ask them questions personally, get an autograph, which I'm sure you might want to get that. Um, they'll be up there. So we just want to thank you so much for being out here again. And Actually, again next year. Could we, get, could we get the helpers on stage? Oh, yeah. Helpers, helpers. Since I'm the only one who cheated. <laughs> <laughs>